So good afternoon and welcome to the Scripps Technical Forum. I am Douglas Alban, the lead engineer for the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes here at Scripps. In addition, I function as the STF chair and get assistance setting up and running the STF for my colleagues here on campus, Gwyn Nero and Vanessa Scott. Gwyn is the Director of Corporate Affiliates, Business Development, Industry Outreach and Innovation, and Vanessa is an Industry Relations and Innovation Analyst. We welcome your input on future speakers. Please let us know if you have an internal or external speaker that would be of interest to our community here at Scripps. If you've missed any of the previously recorded STF pre presentations, you can find them on the Scripps Technical Forum playlist on the Scripps Oceanography YouTube channel. Please know that today's presentation is being recorded. You've all been muted when you logged into the conference. Please post your questions into the chat as they come up, or, or actually into the Q&A, if you could do that, as they come up during the presentation. They will be answered at the end of the presentation. Today, we have a pre-recorded webinar by Chad Collette, founder and CEO of Subsea Imaging, as he reviews some of the fundamentals of underwater photography with the goal of helping you to be more prepared to collect survey data using video footage and images. Designed for beginners and pros alike, this webinar will help you understand topics such as lighting, depth of field, ISO, aperture, shutter speed, backscatter, and digital nose so that you can capture better footage and images for your scientific research. And as I already expressed, uh, there will be a live Q&A with Chad at the end. With that, I will hand it off to Chad. And Good afternoon. My name is Chad Collett, founder and CEO of Subsea Imaging. Before I get started, I'd like to thank Scripps Technical Forum for hosting this session. In today's webinar, I'm going to be sharing some pro tips and best practices with the goal of helping you get better results. This webinar is designed for all types of underwater professionals who use camera systems. You might be wondering about my expertise in underwater imaging. As I mentioned, I'm the founder of Subsea Imaging. Subsea develops industry-leading underwater camera and video systems, LEDs, lasers, and software for marine research, offshore energy, aquaculture, fisheries, and other industries. With years of experience in our field, we understand the very critical performance required by equipment going out to sea. Oceanographic researchers spend weeks to months planning surveys and it costs a lot to conduct this type of research. Ships are expensive and that is why we understand that you do not choose your partners lightly. I have a background as a diver in the Canadian Navy, an ROV pilot with Oceaneering, a subsea inspection and project manager, and then as a camera system designer. I manage our camera system products here at Subsea and I am involved in all parts of design from water corrected optics, imaging sensor and lens, image processing, electronic subsystem design, and software interface. So why is this knowledge important to you? Collecting good images and video for your project is usually critical. As an oceanographic scientist, researcher, or professional, it can be challenging to get vessel time for your project. You only get a short amount of time to collect the survey data, so being prepared is important. I'm hoping that today's webinar will give you insight in the fundamentals of underwater photography and the goal of helping you be more prepared to make that next big discovery and collect high quality survey data. Today I'll be covering camera settings, including the three main pillars of photography, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Next, I'll cover off on optical considerations, such as sharpness, distortion, chromatic aberration, and field of view. Then we'll talk about lighting. We'll also talk about why lasers are used underwater. And finally, I'll move on to some other topics such as JPEG RAW, uh, IP cameras, and mechanical considerations. So why are camera settings important to understand? In photography, the exposure triangle explains the relationship between shutter speed, ISO, and aperture. Whether you're shooting underwater or in air, these three factors are at the center of every exposure and resulting image. The three settings are linked and changing one affects the others. 
Like the iris of your eye, aperture blades on a lens of the camera control how much light is let into the camera lens. The amount of light that reaches your camera's imaging sensor will determine what the exposure looks like. Each aperture setting on the lens is referred to as an f-stop, a fraction that indicates the diameter of the lens opening. Aperture also determines the depth of field and sharpness. In a subsea application, there is often a lot of activity happening. The scene often requires a fairly wide depth of field. For this reason, a fixed aperture is most common in a subsea camera. It is not a parameter you will need to adjust or worry about in most camera systems. Shutter speed determines the duration that the exposure takes and thereby how much light is sampled. A faster shutter speed like 1 over 500 or 2 milliseconds has the effect of freezing motion while a slower shutter speed like 1 over 30 or 33 milliseconds may have some motion blur. If the target is moving, faster shutter speeds are necessary. Faster shutter speeds also require more light. When increasing the ISO, it allows you to work with less light. However, if the ISO is increased, oftentimes there will be more noise and less detail in your image or video. In other words, when increasing your ISO, it will bring light into dark images, but as a result, can diminish the quality of the shot. A general rule of thumb is to start with the lowest ISO to give adequate brightness to the image. Increase the ISO only if your lighting is already at maximum output. Decrease ISO if there's too much light instead of decreasing your light's output. And now I'll demonstrate how the exposure controls can be used to adjust for the lighting in your scene. ISO is the sensitivity or gain of your sensor. So decreasing the ISO decreases that sensitivity. Increasing the ISO increases the sensitivity, but it also increases noise. Increasing your shutter speed reduces the amount of light that hits the sensor and how long that light hits the sensor. So in order to get a good exposure, you need to adjust both values. Using auto exposure, the camera automatically adjusts for those settings. And then you can use exposure value stops to get finer tuned adjustment on that auto, auto exposure. I'll zoom out and I'll turn on my lamp. You can see then how the lamp affects the auto exposure and how with lighting in manual exposure it allows you to achieve uh, lower ISO values and higher shutter speeds. Depth of field is the distance in the scene that is in focus at one time. The depth of field range of a camera is determined by its sensor size, lens aperture, and focal length. A narrow depth of field could be due to a very large sensor or wide aperture in the lens, as seen in the top image. A wide depth of field is often related to the sensor being smaller or the aperture being narrow or stopped down, as seen in the bottom image. In subsea cameras, depth of field can be adjusted primarily with a couple of variables. One, the focus distance. As you focus at near distance, the depth of field narrows. As you focus further away, the depth of field widens. For example, at one meter, you may have a pretty narrow depth of field. At three meters, it widens out to cover a uh, further distance. And at infinity, it covers everything from you know, say maybe three, four meters to infinity. The second parameter that affects depth of field is your optical zoom. As the lens zooms in on the subject, this has the effect of narrowing the depth of field. From the point of view of the lens, zooming in moves the camera closer to the subject. So even if you're actually five meters away from the subject, the math treats this as one meter, for example, when you zoom in. We've got a few objects here in our uh, test tank. 
that are at various distances. This rotating target is at one meter. This uh, test frame is at about three meters and the background is about eight meters away from the camera. So I'm gonna show the effect of depth of field as we focus at different distances. I'm just gonna digital zoom so you can easily, more easily see that effect. So right now, uh, the background is in focus. I'm gonna put it in autofocus and the background is still in focus because that's on the center of the frame. So you can see little particles floating around in the water. The reason you would want to show, the uh, reason you might want manual focus is because if you have it in auto, the camera might actually try to start focusing on objects in the foreground, uh, particles in the water. And depending on how much turbidity in, is in the water, you, you may want uh, to switch to manual. So. We're, in, we're focused on the background now, so I'm going to bring it closer and get this target more in focus. So you can see these bolts are in focus, and now the background is out of focus. This object at around three meters is out of focus, so if we want to focus on that and bring that a little sharper, now this target is more in focus. The, because this is around uh, with this camera anyways, at around three meters, we're close to infinity focus anyways because it's got a pretty wide depth of field. Uh, the background is also in focus. When you set your camera's white balance, you are telling it what you expect the color temperature of the scene to be. If the camera is set to auto, it will pick the setting as best it can. Cameras do not know exactly what white is in every possible setting and scenario. An LED strobe or lamp emits light at a certain color temperature, usually around 5000 Kelvin, similar to sunlight. The color temperature of light will change as it passes down from the surface through the water. The reds are attenuated out. This is an example photo with and without the white balance adjusted. The red wavelengths are quickly attenuated in water. With white balance, it can be reapplied to the image and video, as you see on the left. To demonstrate white balance for the purpose of this webinar, let's say that the camera is operating in shallow water on the coast, the sun is shining, and there's a lot of algae in the water. So it's filtering through with a, a tint of green and what white balance allows you to simply do is adjust for those conditions to return it to the color balance that uh, is more natural. The deep ocean is a low light environment. Ambient light decreases the deeper you go. This means in order to capture quality subsea videos and images, you'll need the right lighting. Without it, you won't get the results you're looking for in your marine research or offshore survey. In underwater systems, power availability matters, and in a camera system, the lights use the most power. For this reason, select LEDs and strobes that have a high lumen output per watt of power. More lights are not always better, and floodlights are not always better. You need the right amount of light and you need it to be directed where you need it. So what is motion blur? It is simply an effect that occurs when the shutter speed of the camera is too low for the scene, or something in the scene is moving too quickly for your setup. If you're taking digital stills, select a sub-sea LED with a strobe or flash capability. Strobes output a lot of light in a very short period of time. This has an advantage over steady burning lights as you can increase the shutter speed and freeze subjects to remove motion blur. If flying over the seafloor in a fast moving vehicle, then a strobe will enable freezing the scene in digital stills. Some marine species are also sensitive to lamps and light, but a strobe has a lot less of an effect on creatures because of its extremely short duration. Next, I'll demonstrate how lighting with a strobe or lamp affects your exposure settings. So first, I'll turn on my lamp, and then I'll take a photo. In review, you can see that there's some motion blur. So what I can do is I can increase my 
my shutter speed. I can also bump my ISO up. Take another photo in review. There's still some motion blur, you can see. So what I can also do, this is where a strobe comes in. I can turn on a strobe. Strobe compensation is the number of exposure stops that it will stop down when taking that photo. And then on review, the motion blur is gone. It took it at 1 over 500. I could, if I want even less, I could do another stop down, take the photo, and review. And that are, there's definitely no motion blur. It involves a little trial and error for your travel speed while doing a survey uh, or how fast your subjects are moving in the scene. Uh, but once it's tuned in, uh, you can get consistently frozen images. Backscatter is caused by particles such as sediment or plankton being illuminated by lights. It can present another challenge in collecting quality data. Backscatter has to do with the positioning of the LEDs, their beam angles, and overlap of the camera field of view. In this image, the LED is positioned directly next to the camera, and there's a lot of backscatter. In this image, the lights are positioned further from the camera, which reduces the backscatter. And in this image, the light output is reduced to eliminate foreground backscatter. It's important to select LEDs that match your application. Backscatter can be reduced with an LED that is designed to match the camera field of view. A floodlight has a beam angle greater than 90 degrees. A directional light has a beam angle less than 90 degrees. Floodlights spread light everywhere, even where you don't need it, but they allow for less planning. Directional lights, or beams, produce less backscatter and can be more intentionally positioned to illuminate the scene. Infrared and red are the first wavelengths of light to get absorbed at around 5 meters because they have the longest wavelengths with the lowest energy. Orange and yellow follow at around 10 to 20 meters, green at 30 to 40 meters, and eventually blue colors start to get absorbed at 60 meters and deeper. Once you get to 200 meters, photosynthesis is no longer possible. No photons from the sun reach 1,000 meters. The only light is from bioluminescence. When a human dives in a submarine or with scuba gear, their eyes and brain will adjust for the loss of color at depth. When you take a photo, the camera does not adjust for the missing colors of sunlight. Using a combination of white and colored LEDs, you can help compensate for any deficiencies. There are added benefits to having a red LED if you are conducting a natural behavior study. Many sea creatures are unable to see in the red spectrum, and by using a red LED, you could capture images of some creatures in their natural state. Other colors can be used to do unique science. Deep blue can potentially induce fluorescence. There are also UV and IR wavelengths, which have applications in science and energy. A common overlooked aspect of underwater imaging is the lens and optical parameters. Often when choosing a camera for a project, the technical specifications such as resolution, size, and weight are the first considerations. The parameters shown here on this slide can have a much higher impact on the image quality than even the sensor size or image resolution. Sharpness is often the most important factor in, in an imaging system. It is the variable that determines the resolving power of the system. It is often in terms of millimeters per pixel, similar to the DPI of a printed photo. The sharpness is much higher in a water-corrected lens. Sharp images have more detail, which is particularly important for any application requiring data processing, such as photogrammetry, 3D modeling, machine vision, or object detection. 
These graphs are created by an image analysis software that we use here at SubC. The image on the left is of a flat port and the image on the right is of a corrected optic. The higher the value of sharpness, the more detail in the image. You can see with a flat port, the image sharpness is lower as you go from the center of the lens to the edge. The effect is still present with a corrected optic, but this is because of an inherent effect of all lenses. But the overall sharpness is even out across the whole image. And you can see that with the color coding here. It's blue on the edges, which means it's really low, and it never reaches blue in the water corrected. Chromatic aberration. So in terms of image quality, some values like sharpness, you want a higher number. With chromatic aberration, you want a lower number or value. The lower chromatic aberration, the better the image result. The comparison image here shows there's clear color bleeding and chromatic aberration in the image taken with a flat port on the left and in comparison to the corrected optic on the right. At SubC, we run every single optic through comprehensive image analysis software. The image on the left is of a flat port and the image on the right is a corrected optic. So here you can see the chromatic aberration is evened out and quite low across the whole image. And on the flat port, it's pretty low in the middle. It's low in the middle and then it gets progressively worse and reaches a very high value on the edge. This image was taken with a camera that does not have a corrective optic. And while it is a striking photo of a sea lily, it has some issues. Because the subject is framed by a black background, it makes it easier to see the chromatic aberration. We'll zoom in on the area of the image in the blue square. Now that it is magnified, we can see it more clearly, this color fringing. Chromatic aberration is due to the differences of refraction between red, green, and blue colors of light when going from water into a lens. Each color has been separated before making it to the sensor. It also reduces the effective sharpness of the image because it spreads the light out. Distortion is caused by the refraction of light as it transitions from water to the lens system. It is a deviation of expected geometry. A water corrected lens removes distortion. We're all used to seeing the way distortion affects light as it passes through a water lens. Your hands in water appear magnified and your fingers are slightly bent. It is only when you see a human-made object with straight angles underwater that it becomes obvious how much distortion is in the image and in the camera system. This is an image of a calibration target. It is run through analysis which quantitatively defines the amount of distortion. With a flat optic, you may get up to 8 to 10 percent distortion. And this is another image with our water corrected optics run through the same software. Uh, you can see here it's less than 3 percent, roughly. Uh, usually get between you know, 1 to 3 percent with a corrected optic. Related to the distortion that we covered above is the field of view of the camera. The water itself has to be taken into account as part of the lens system. Water has a refractive index of 1.33 and seawater is similar but has a lot of variability with depth, salinity, and other dissolved elements. The water lens interface causes magnification up to 33%. Field of view of the image is reduced because of the magnification effect. Water, cor water corrected lens returns the geometry of the image to an in-air equivalent. An 80 degree field of view lens would be reduced to less than a 60 degrees uh, field of view with a simple flat acrylic port, for example. Lasers are another tool in the underwater photographer's toolbox. So why do we use lasers? They provide a visual reference to objects underwater. It is difficult to determine the scale of a subject without a frame of reference. Think of a laser as an underwater ruler painted on the scene. It can also help measure or estimate distance to the subject. There are two common types of underwater lasers, parallel dots and line lasers. 
There are also a variety of other types such as grids, crosshairs, circles, and other patterns. Each has their own use, but the most common are dots and lines. Parallel dot lasers project two beams that appear as green dots in images that are used to get distance and scale of underwater objects. Usually parallel dots are the lowest cost form factor of laser. They are also attached to the camera so that the dots are parallel with the frame of reference. The spacing between the dots gives both range and scale information. This works best when the scene is perpendicular to the camera sensor, such as a vertical view of the seafloor, straight down. The parallel dots can give rough sizing of subjects in the scene using simple methods in photo editors. This can be made more accurate with calibrated cameras and specific software. A grid laser projects hundreds of points onto the scene. This gives multiple redundant data points that allow for more complex geometry. The points spread out at a predictable angle from the laser. This is an example of what grid looks like painted onto the scene. Having multiple evenly spaced points on a target gives many data points to help build geometry. Line lasers are used for precision applications for generating data from images. Often the data is for creating a 3D model or a point cloud. Now we'll demonstrate what a laser looks like in the scene and how you may have to adjust your exposure settings to get the best effect. So we're in auto exposure. I'll change to manual. I'll, re I'll increase our shutter speed to make the laser line sharper. I'm just going to zoom in. So we can see that even closer. As you'll see, as you increase your shutter speed, that line gets sharper. In a line scan situation, there, there may be no lights on, and it may be digital stills of a laser line. And we can take a photo just to show what that looks like. It's quite sharp. And in a line scan situation, you would be moving across the scene with the laser on, and as objects move past it, you're capturing images of that profile. Other imaging considerations. When taking digital stills, the two most common formats are JPEG and RAW. A JPEG photo is run through an image signal processing algorithm, or ISP. The ISP has several steps to improve the visual look of the image, such as denoising, sharpening, HDR, color correction, and more. The file is then compressed to make it smaller. JPEG photos are what we are all used to seeing. And this is acceptable for greater than 90% of users. A raw image is data straight from the sensor, saved to a file, uh, pixel by pixel, and it may not look as visually appealing at first as a JPEG, but this is the format preferred by photographers as they can then run their own processing in Adobe or similar and apply their own effects, rather than using the automatic JPEG processing. The image on the left is a raw, straight from the sensor, and the image on the right is an edited version with color corrections applied. The JPEG ISP in a camera does the same thing, but automatically. The industry has been moving um, to the IP camera standard for a number of years because it simplifies subsea connections and multiplexers. An IP camera outputs video and data over an Ethernet connection. It is simpler than analog video standards, and it is a digital standard, so there is less frame loss due to noise. Your subsea application will determine the depth rating and material requirements or considerations you need to take. Aluminum and plastics are generally good for 500 meters or less. Duplex stainless steel is usually used for up to 3,000 meters, but it's heavy. And if you're deploying for weeks or months, and even if you're at depths of only 300 or 1,000 feet, um, then you should consider titanium and plastics for corrosion proofing. It is also a very lightweight material. This combination of properties informed our decision to standardize on 6,000 meter titanium for all of our equipment here at Subsea. 
Here's a listing of the reference articles that I referred to when preparing this webinar. If you have comments or suggestions about this topic, I would be more than happy to speak with you personally. I hope that you found this webinar informative. Our goal was to save you time so that you can focus on that next discovery, your research or your subsea survey project. Subsea Imaging takes pride in helping underwater professionals achieve success. Thank you for watching. We'll now take some time to answer your questions. So now we have a few minutes. We can take some time from questions from any of the guests. You can put them in the Q&A or you can uh, raise your hand, whatever you would like, we'll monitor that and, and see what we have. Now we had one that Ian answered already, which was, does subsea sell that rotating color bar calibration apparatus or is that specialized in-house testing equipment? And um, he suggested reaching out to uh, subsea to get more information on that. Well, Doug, I guess, I guess I hope that means uh, we answered all of the questions. Yeah, it's a great presentation and takes me back <laughs> to my uh, photography classes way back when. Awesome. Thank you for uh, the presentation today. I do see a few more questions that have come in the Q&A. Oh, in the Q&A. See, I wasn't, my, I'm glad that you're there because I was, I missed that. All right, there we go. I was looking at the, I was on the answer tab. All right. So first one from Isabel Kay is, would you mind showing the references again? And Isabel, I would just say that the, this is recorded, so you can um, go to the end of the video once it's posted on our YouTube channel, or I'm sure that Subsea could just send those directly to you and they'll be getting a um, attendee list. So um, I'm, I would, I'm not gonna speak for them, but I'm sure they can get that to you. Absolutely, absolutely, we can send that along. Yeah, and then Douglas Penny says, I have been struggling with optical pyramid whilst trying to improve imagery on my drone. Hmm. Is your drone a above water or underwater uh, uh, drone? That would be my first question. Yeah. I, do our, our um, Vanessa, do you know, is everybody uh, able to unmute themselves? I believe we can unmute them. Yeah, just in case uh, it might be easier for some of these, we can just. I know we can unmute them individually, but is there a way to just do it en masse in case questions come up? Let me see. So yeah, optical pyramid is uh, light scattering at random, uh, random pyramid textures. Um, I guess it would be similar to chromatic aberration. I'm, I'm not 100% familiar with that term, actually. It's not something we've uh, directly dealt with, unless it's a, a term uh, with another name for one of the co topics I covered. Uh, and I, I think I'd need to see more specifically, you know, what imaging system you were potentially using on your drone. And uh, we could recommend uh, maybe a different lens system or something. Uh, it's, uh, it ultimately ends up being quite complicated sometimes. All right, so the next one is from Marshall. Uh, and it just says, how would you, uh, how do you compensate for changing light conditions? For example, a deployed time-lapse camera that is within five to 10 feet of the surface. In those conditions, I would um, first use an auto exposure. Uh, make sure your camera has an auto exposure of some sort and um, also test deploy, right? If you're going to be doing a really long duration, test deploy at first uh, and, you know, do recovery and adjust your settings. Try to simulate those settings perhaps in the lab a little bit um, before doing a really long deployment. 
Uh, I've allowed, so Isabella and Douglas are able to uh, ask their questions live too. I see Isabella is uh, raised her hand. Hi, um, thanks for, that was a great presentation. And yes, it reminded me of my long ago photo classes. Um, but I was wondering about the IP cameras. So um, one question I had was, uh, does that format allow for using less power? First of all, can you transmit wirelessly from IP cameras, do mm, you think? If, if you're working in an area, um, there are wireless IP camera formats. Uh-huh. And yeah. uh, would that reduce the power needed because you're not sending like analog data? Uh, Possibly, I would say, I would say there's definitely low power IP cameras you can get, like um, uh, bring come back to drones. Actually, yeah, uh, a lot of modern drones transmit their video wirelessly from the drone, like a DJI drone uh, would transmit video wirelessly to your cell phone. Actually, uh, okay. and it's very low power. So, absolutely, yeah. Okay, thank you. No problem. All right, then we have a question uh, that is, is there a preferred ROV system for turbid tropical coastal waters? Not that I'm aware of, not a preferred ROV system. Um, there are hundreds of different ROV systems um, and you know, hundreds of different cameras on those ROV systems. Um, and if you're, if you're in turbid waters, you might want to consider something I never covered uh, and it would be image enhancement algorithms. We actually have those built into some of our cameras uh, or our camera software at least. Um, and that's a algorithm that kind of cuts through or mm, does some does some uh, uh, does some processing to remove some of the turbidity. So it's a, again another fairly complex a simple question with a complex answer. Um, there's a lot of different systems out there. So uh, yeah. And then we have a question from Jose, which is about fouling problems. Right, I, I'm, I think you mean, um, say if you're deployed for a long period of time, uh, I actually see some people on, on the webinar here who are very experienced with that uh, in ocean observatories um, and fouling conditions. There's a couple of different ways of dealing with that uh, in that type of format. There's an active uh, mechanical format such as uh, using wipers um, and there's another optical or a, a light based way which would be using UV lights to uh, to pulse on a on an interval you know once every few hours and that would keep a lot of marine growth from forming on the lens of the camera uh, and there's another third way actually um, which is if your camera's on like a pan tilt um, you could have your your time lapse, aim the pan tilt down so that marine sediment didn't collect on the lens uh, while the camera was offline in between time lapse periods. And I, uh, to go back to the previous question on turbidity, um, Douglas Penny put in a, a link to someone in Scotland who's developed a successful commercial laser options. Hmm. All right, so the next one is from Marshall. It says, after photos have been taken, can you alter the photo quality for better clarity? We have had issues in which setup was optimized. However, as lighting changed, photos were either over or underexposed. Yeah, I would, um, in those situations, if you can, I would recommend taking raw photos. So that's the technique or the, the workflow, I guess, that a photographer would use. Um, and in taking a raw photo, uh, it allows you to post process and, and do what you would like with it. Um, that would be the recommended approach, I believe. All right, and then I would just going to reach back to Douglas Penny to see if you got your question answered because uh, yeah. you put another comment in there. Um, and I wasn't sure if we covered that or not. Mm. Um, so drone yeah with a uh, regular dji okay so 
I wouldn't, I, I, maybe you're referring to like how the light is maybe from the sun is reflecting off of things and causing uh, like a chromatic effect, like a, a rainbow type of effect. Um, and there are filters. There are filters you can put on your camera. You can get them on uh, online. And I, a friend of mine actually has a DJI and he bought a pack of uh, polarizing filters to put on his lens. Thanks. I, I know I had deterred from the subject of being uh, submerged photography, but I appreciate that answer. Thank you very much. No worries. It's, uh, there's a lot of crossover between, uh, you know, drone photography and AUV photography uh, in the underwater and above water, and a lot of the same principles apply. Uh, there are additional challenges underwater, as, as there are different challenges with drones as well. So. It's all very interesting to me. Appreciate the question. Thank well, you I think very that, much. Yeah, I think that covers all the questions that uh, was put into the Q&A. If there's nothing else, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for the uh, presentation today. Thank you, Chad and team. Thanks, Doug. We'll see you on the next venture. Have a great week.